Hello, everyone, and welcome to Liberating the Queen. I am Susie Mosco, and today on March 15th, 2018, we will be talking about a total Egyptian badass. Her name was Queen Hetsetsu, but for today, we're going to call her Queen H, because much like I've learned from our first episode with Jean Bure, um, I do not want to butcher the ancient Egyptian language. Um, she is attributed to being one of Egypt's greatest and longest rulers. She was also lost in the history books, some by her own doing and others by people trying to erase her existence as a pharaoh. There is a lot of information out there about Queen H. As always, we will have citations, quotes, and accompanying book titles. But it wasn't until around the 1900s that people were really able to put together that she even existed. There continues to be a lot of questions and a lot of excitement. There's even a rumored movie that's being talked about and a script being written, much like Cleopatra. But today, we're going to focus on how she came into power, uh, what was she was able to accomplish in her 15 to 16 year rule, and how Egypt really tried to diminish her rule and erase her existence. So get comfortable and get ready to walk like an Egyptian. In Egypt, they had a strong belief in continuity. So if you look at their family tree, it is literally a straight line. The pharaohs would marry what was called the great wife. That would be the first wife. Um, and then they would have multiple wives after that who would also bear children. In Egyptian history, we don't see this a lot where the firstborn is a female and becomes a prominent figure, but it is something that did happen in Egypt. So when you look at names like um, Nefertiti or Cleopatra, they were in similar situations as Queen H. Queen H, though, she was a traditionalist. She did ensure that in certain places there was more a masculine notation to some of the things that were being written about her and or observed about her. It's easy to be confused and it was easy for males to take the credit, much like it is easy for them to take the credit today. Um, but this is really the crux of what lies in Queen H's whole rule and, and her story really parallels and struggle with some of the similar things that women do go through today. The perception of when females rule, there is crisis. Um, you saw that today when Marissa Meyer first took the spot in Yahoo, uh, there was just a lot of attention and a lot of people going into crisis mode. Now that, of course, didn't end the best, but most stories people love to tell are of women leaders who are in crisis, not necessarily stories of women who did everything right, a la you hear more stories of Jezebel, Nefertiti, or Cleopatra, and less stories about women like Queen H. When she was born, her name actually means foremost of noble women, or she is first among noble women. Her father was a great warrior, and her mother was said to be a direct descendant of the sun, which is pretty badass. Um, like in our last episode with Ida B. Wells, she was very close to her father, and her father carried that warrior sense in that really more militant way of raising her child. Um, and it just kind of resonates with the importance of having that strong father and that strong mother figure when raising these really great women. And, and as I've been reading and as I've been learning, I see that more and more. Her father really favored her and, and much that I read talked about her being kind of that daddy's girl. But he traveled with her. He took her places. He introduced her to people. During this time, Egypt was very bureaucratic and, and had its democracy down. It was thriving. Um, essentially, the Nile would flood every year, and that would make the soil more prosperous for them to be able to uh, sell goods, trade goods, and really have enough things to build a solid economy around. So she learned a lot around traveling with her father and really meeting the people. Um, she was taught traditionally through tutors in ways of being a pharaoh. She was schooled in traditional learnings of math, religion, and also learned how to use a javelin, which again, pretty badass. One tidbit that I found fascinating was that as these young pharaohs are being educated, 
they are taught to write. Um, so when they become leaders and older, they will have scribes and all these other people that are writing for them. But at a very young age, they actually sit down and are taught to write themselves. Now, if you've ever read hieroglyphics or seen anything in ancient Egyptian, it looks pretty complex to me. So I definitely put that in another category of badass. She began her reign as regent to her stepson, Thutmose the third, who for this podcast we will be referring to as Pharaoh T. He would succeed her. When she became his regent, he was 18 months old. So he wasn't able to say any of the words that were required to become Pharaoh. He probably wasn't sitting still if he was anything like my children. Um, So she was his regent, and really embraced the role that had been bestowed upon her. In around the seventh year of her reign, however, she chooses to be depicted more as a male pharaoh in all of the statues that are created around her, but still referring to herself as female in all of her inscriptions. Um, She was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty during the period known as the New Kingdom and regarded as one of the best. In Egypt, there is very clear laws that state no woman can be a pharaoh. So there's a lot of controversy around people claiming that she is the best pharaoh or one of the most affluent pharaohs. Historian Mark Van de Meerope expresses the conventional view of Queen H when he notes how she, quote, has become one of the most celebrated and controversial women of Egypt and in the ancient world in general, end quote. Queen H was the daughter of the I, so Pharaoh T. I, by the great wife Amosis. Pharaoh T. I also fathered Tutmos II, so Pharaoh T. II, by his secondary wife. As Egyptian royal tradition depicts, and as we talked about earlier, the lineage is literally one line. So Pharaoh T. II married Queen H, and that's how Pharaoh T. III was born. Um, All of this happened before she was even 20 years old. After she wed, Queen H was elevated to the position of God's wife of Amma, the highest honor a woman could attain in Egypt. After the position of queen and actually bestowing far more power than most queens ever knew. This was very prestigious and as an honorary title for a woman of upper class who assisted the high priest in his duties at the great temple. By the time of the New Kingdom, however, a woman holding the title of God's wife of Amma was powerful enough to dictate policy. In her role as the God's wife, Queen H would have been considered his consort and would have presided over his festivals. This would have essentially elevated her to the status of a divine being and that it would have been her role to sing and dance for the god at the beginning of festivals to arouse him for the creative act by engaging directly with the god. She would have taken on an elevative status. The details of exact duties of a god's wife are a little bit unclear. Um, As I understand, it's fairly difficult to piece together pieces of Egyptian history just based on, you know, well-taken notes and lack of information. Um, But some of these rituals and things become more apparent as we see them consistent throughout history. Queen H and Pharaoh T2 had a daughter. While Pharaoh T2 fathered a son with a lesser wife, Isis, this is the son who would, she would serve as his regent and who we refer to as Pharaoh T3. After Pharaoh T2 died, when Uh, Pharaoh T3 was still a child, Queen H became the regent, controlling affairs of the state until he came of age, much like we mentioned earlier. So she not only takes on the role or the position of God's wife of Amma, but also is now taking on the role of the Pharaoh, which provides her with a lot of power. In the seventh year of her regency, much like we mentioned before, when she started to look at herself more masculine in statues, she actually just decided to change the rules and had herself crowned pharaoh of Egypt. 
again, a pretty badass move, I think. She took on all the royal titles and names, which she had inscribed using the feminine grammatical form, but had herself depicted as a male pharaoh in statues, much like I said before. This is where some of her learnings come in handy in being able to write um, on her own and understanding more uh, the complexity of the inscriptions to ensure that she can have her place and kind of state her claim on being a pharaoh. Now, as the author Van de Marope writes, quote, whereas she had been represented as a woman in earlier status and relief sculptures, after her coronation as king, she appears with male dress and gradually became represented with a male physique. Her breasts did not show and she stood in a traditional man's posture rather than a woman. Some reliefs were even recarved to adjust her representation to appear more like a man. End quote. Her statues showed her in all these, you know, all this great royal grandeur in the forefront uh, while you know, Pharaoh T3 rendered a smaller scale behind or below her to indicate his lower status. She still referred to her stepson as king, but he was he was only in name. Queen Each clearly felt she had as much right to rule Egypt as any man, and her depiction in art stressed this. Recognizing that she was in enchartered waters, Queen H took steps to legitimize her reign quickly. If her position as pharaoh were to be challenged, she was not going to allow herself to simply disappear. Queen H began her reign by marrying her daughter to Pharaoh T3 and bestowing her daughter the position of God's wife of Amma, similar to how she secured her position, she bestowed that on her daughter and making sure that she could have the same privileges that Queen H did. Queen H eventually legitimized her reign by presenting herself not merely as Amun's wife in ritual, but as his daughter. She claimed that Amun had appeared to her mother in the form of Pharaoh T1 and conceived her, thus making her a demigoddess. Her inscription relates the night of her conception as her mother lay in bed, and and I quote, He, Amma, in the incarnation of the majesty of her husband, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, this would be uh, Pharaoh T1, found her sleeping in the beauty of her palace. She awoke at the divine fragrance and turned towards his majesty. He went to her immediately. He was aroused by her and he imposed his desire upon her. He allowed her to see him in his form of a god and she rejoiced at the sight of his beauty. After he had come before her, his love passed into her body the palace was flooded with the divine fragrance, end quote. She didn't stop by telling everyone she was a demi goddess, even though for me it feels like enough and the story seems legit. She kept moving her legitimacy through other public buildings, um, showing Pharaoh T1, making her his co-ruler, claiming that Amma had earlier sent an oracle predicting her rise to power. She presented herself as a direct successor to Amos, whose name the people still remembered as their great liberator, in order to further strengthen her position and defend against dictators who would claim a woman was unfit to rule. Her numerous inscriptions, monuments, and temples all demonstrated how unprecedented her reign was, No woman before her had ruled the country openly as this pharaoh. She kept the economy moving forward. She set out commissioning building projects, such as her beautiful temple at Dair el Bara. She sent out military expeditions. The exact nature of the military campaigns is still a bit unclear, and it's contested across multiple articles. But their objectives were the regions of essentially Syria and Dubai. 
It is likely that the campaigns were launched simply to uphold the tradition of Pharaoh as a warrior king, bringing wealth into the land. Um, Conquest could have been seen as a continuation of her father's campaign. Again, further really just legitimizing her position so she couldn't really be provoked. The pharaohs of the new kingdom, the Age of Empire, placed great emphasis on keeping a secure buffer zone around the country to avoid a repeat of what they saw as an invasion. Queen H's greatest effort went into these building projects, which not only elevated her name and honored the gods, but employed a lot of people. The scope and size of Queen H's constructions, as well as their elegant beauty, attest to a very prosperous region. None of her projects could have been completed as they were if she were not in command of the wealth of resources that she had um, leading the affluent country of Egypt. Queen H's expedition to Punt, which is a modern day Somalia, there is some controversy between if it is Somalia, if it can be found or not, but her crowning achievement in her eyes um, in the documentation was that Punt had been a partner in trade since the time of the Middle Kingdom, but expeditions there were expensive and time-consuming. Queen H could launch her own expedition, especially one so lavish, It is a testament to, again, how prosperous she continued to reign, even in her later days. The inscription which accompanies the relief of her expedition engraved on the walls of her temple at Dair el-Bara describes the luxury in great detail. Her temple remains one of the most impressive and often visited in Egypt. Briar and Hobbes note in their book, quote, The art produced under her authority was soft and delicate, and she constructed one of the most elegant temples in Egypt against the cliffs outside the Valley of the King, end quote. Her temple rose from beside the River Nile with a long ramp ascending from a courtyard of trees and small pools to a terrace. Some of these trees were brought in from Punt and are the first known successful transplant trees from one nation to another in history. The remains of these trees are really fossilized stumps, can still be seen in the courtyard of the temple in present day. The lower terrace was lined with columns and a ramp that land up to the second terrace, which was equally impressive. The temple was decorated with statuary, reliefs, and inscriptions with her burial chamber carved out of the cliffs, which formed the back building. Queen H's temple was so admired by pharaohs who came after her that they increasingly chose to be buried nearby, and uh, it eventually became known as the Valley of the Kings. There was only one pharaoh that came before Queen H, Ramses II, who built as much on such a grander scale, um, but there was no one that came after her. Her projects were so well constructed, in fact, that there were few museums featuring ancient Egyptian art and artifacts in present day that do not have some piece that was commissioned by Queen Eight. Now, during this time, while Queen H had been ruling the country, Pharaoh T3 had not been sitting quietly by. Uh, she gave him command of the armies of Egypt. And it has been uh, discussed in many of the readings that I did, but most notably by Egyptologist James Henry Breasted, that he really survived her reign by proving himself useful as her general and more or less keeping out of the way. In 1457 BCE, Pharaoh T. III led his armies to put down a rebellion from Kadesh, Um, a campaign possibly anticipated and commissioned by Queen H. And afterwards, after that date and that battle, her name really disappears from historical record. Pharaoh T. III backdated his reign to the death of his father, and Queen H.'s accomplishments as Pharaoh were ascribed to him. 
When and how she died was unknown until recently. Egyptologist Zaya Hawass claimed to have located her mummy in the Cairo Museum Holdings in 2006 CE. An examination of that mummy shows that she did in her 50s from an abacus following a tooth extraction pass away. Pharaoh T3 went on to become a great pharaoh. He was really known as the Napoleon of ancient Egypt for his brilliant military victories. Later in his reign, he had all evidence of his stepmother erased from mountains and all evidence of her reign destroyed. His reign is more famous because he built his leadership and his regime really around fear. Her reign was famous because she really built it around prosperity and more of the economy of Egypt. Um, And it's interesting looking back and reading some of the articles to see the places where Queen H was erased. I mean, not only was there just some pronouns missing when he had um, assigned people to start removing some of the femininity around her scribes, but also in just the two different leadership styles, which made it easier from one of the articles I read for historians to really be able to decipher where his reign may have actually began. Now, it was really easy for Pharaoh T3 to remove all of this because most of his siblings or all of his siblings had passed away as well as Queen H's daughter. So no one was really at court, it seemed, who had the power or inclination to change this policy. The wreckage of some of these works were dumped near her temple at Dar el Bar, and excavation brought her name to light along with the inscriptions inside the temple. So originally, Pharaoh T had taken a lot of the inscriptions and removed a lot of the pronouns from things, but also he had covered up a lot of Queen H's inscriptions and carvings um, by simply just putting up a new layer and then re-carving things in there that made it sound like or allow him to take the credit for everything and really erase her from history. Some speculate that the reason why he was able to do some of this was not because people didn't know it was it wasn't happening, but more so that her reign had been so unconventional and departed from tradition that it was more likely supported. In ancient Egypt times, the pharaoh's chief responsibility was the maintenance of harmony and balance. And a woman in a man's position would have been seen as disruptive to that balance. Much like we talked about at the very beginning of the podcast, a lot of times when we talk about women who have done well in a leadership position, it can sometimes be a hard pill for people to swallow as most stories, even in today's world, are around women who are in leadership positions that create more chaos. The pharaoh in ancient Egypt also served as a role model to his people, and it's possible that Pharaoh T3 feared that other women might look to Queen H for inspiration and try to follow her example, thereby departing from a tradition which maintained that men should rule Egypt. And women should only be consorts, as it was the beginning of time when the god Oriasis ruled with his consort Isis. Ancient Egyptian culture was very conservative in many respects and placed no value on change or alteration to that tradition. A female pharaoh, no matter how successful her reign, was outside of the accepted understanding of the role of the monarchy, and so all memory of that pharaoh had to be erased. The Egyptian belief that one lives as long as one's name is remembered however, is exemplified in Queen H's reign. She was forgotten as the period of the new kingdom continued and remained so for centuries. Once her name was found again by the 19th century and then by others throughout the 20th century, she gradually came back into life and assumed her rightful place as one of the greatest pharaohs in Egyptian history.
Thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode three. This was an exciting topic to learn about, and I urge everyone to go out and buy books and read articles on Queen H. There's a ton of information out there, and I believe the reason why there is so much is because we're still discovering things about her. And it's fantastic to hear another great uh, female leader coming out of ancient Egypt, and it's exciting to learn more about her. Today's podcast was sponsored by Flip'em the Bird. When you don't have the words, our gloves will say it for you. Go to flipemthebird.com for more details. Um, as always, our blog post companion will have all of the articles that we used, all books that we use, and all quotes um, cited for you so that you can do more further research. Again, I encourage everyone to take a look at any hidden figures they can find and enjoy your month.